Now you are the host, Dr. Okay. Noor. Now you are the host. Just right. click on the link in the in the program to play the presentation. Um, yes. This you can see okay. my, my side? Yes. All right. So it's now clear for us. All right. Uh, just make sure that the sound is on. Yeah, I think it's on the discourse. Yes. Okay. Of affordable housing research trend. Um, so we have about four after my staff. Uh, and my friends, Dr. Noor Ayd Hanim from the same university, University Utara Malaysia. And we have uh, the third con uh, collaborator, uh, Dr. Aiza Hanim from uh, UCI um, Malaysia. And we also have uh, Dr. Ziwali from Samsung University, Turkey. Okay. So this is our content of uh, article uh, or presentation. Uh, first introduction, methodology, analysis, and result, and conclusion. Okay. Okay, as introductions, uh, as we explore uh, into the complexity of affordable housing, it's uh, critical that uh, we recognize its multiple nature, all right? Housing affordability, as we define uh, by various scholars, uh, encompasses by several dimensions beyond just the monetary uh, aspect. Okay, firstly, uh, housing Dr. Noor, Dr. Okay, Noor, yes. uh, the okay, sound, okay. there is no okay. sound now. Step. Uh, uh, can so you hear it? The conference step will be... Uh, uh, now there is sound. Okay, here I show you how we conduct okay. all process okay. of the trip uh, analysis. Okay. Uh, basically, in my article, I'm using the Scopus database, all right? So, and uh, in bibliometric, we have four main steps. Okay, first, we need to decide or we choose our focus topic. So, in my article, we become by selecting our focus topic, which is affordable housing, all right? After we decide uh, our focus topic, we can start uh, searching. Uh, which is we need to insert keyword uh, and search string. So uh, we insert keyword and crafted the uh, uh, search string to ensure comprehensive coverage. And our keyword included term like affordable home, affordable house, uh, housing affordability, and home affordability, uh, which is this step was crucial for capturing relevant literature. Okay. Here, 
we insert our keyword and then we start uh, searching and here we can see uh, we found about uh, 2,172 document, right? Uh, based on our keyword. And then the third step is to choose scope and coverage. Yeah, uh, to maintain the quality of our study, we carefully define our scope and coverage uh, criteria. So we excluded like books and lecture notes uh, to focus only on the paper published in a peer review academic journal and additionally we made a selection based on uh, uh, dr noor okay. sorry okay you're here okay uh, the, now yeah. the voice is is working but the slides are not working okay we I choose uh, on the, the connection uh, social sign as a subject area and document type okay. we Can choose you see article that? or journal and language we only focus on english okay. language and then um uh scope now it's type, okay general, mm -hmm. and uh publication stage final uh journal okay and open access i uh in, in our study we only select all open access and after all the the informations uh filter okay we we click limit two and then we can find that uh, the number of document found uh, is about 320 uh, uh document found so all the information here okay um we need to uh the, the, the first step yeah uh in this step we recorded the date of extraction identify record conducted screen screening and we maintain the transparency of by uh, documenting record included and removed and ensuring the integrity of our analysis. So all the information we need to insert in our flow diagram here. Okay, like just now, our focus topic is affordable housing and then we insert the keyword search string and we, we, you can get from here and copy here. And then scope and coverage, like our, we did uh, filter some information and then the date they extracted. Okay, because our uh, study, we uh, conduct uh, 18 April. Okay, then uh, our record identified on screen about uh, 2,153. And then uh, after we do some filter, okay. Our record included for bibliometric analysis is 1,639,000 uh, and the record uh, removed is 514. So this uh, the, 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 the method yeah, or the flow to conduct the uh, bibliometry. Okay, thank you. Okay, uh, this is our analysis and result. Basically, we uh, produce uh, four our uh, objective yeah our first is uh, to see the relationship between co-authorship analysis by country uh, co-occurrence and keywords and co-occurrence and author keywords and font is citation and document and all of this analysis uh, will be uh, analyzed using um, our data scopus data and we run through the voice view software Okay, then. Okay, I think this is some uh, issue, uh, audio problem. Okay, uh, that's all for my presentation. Thank you.
All right. Uh, for uh, thank you for for listening our our group presentation. So uh, the next presenter is Dr. Maria, is it? Dr. Noor. Uh, yes, I am. Uh, okay, we can move to the next presentation. Okay, but uh, how can I can get the slide? Yeah. Okay. Uh, you. Is it good? Is it good morning, Chair? This is Dr. Yeah. Sumbe. Dr. Sumbe, I'm the co-chair. Apologies, I'm joined later. I was uh, also a co-chair in another session. Maybe can I assist? Uh, Okay, you can, uh, Dr. Sampa? Yes, can I assist with giving the presentation? Okay, uh, Dr. Noor can make you the host. Dr. Noor, there are three dots yeah, uh, beside just, your name. Uh, yeah, I just assign uh, uh, Dr. You Sampa. You gave him a... now, yes. You gave him now yeah. the host. So, Dr. Sampa, you can move to the uh, next presentation. Okay, thank you very much. Sorry, yeah. No worries. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Right. Okay, so then let me just share. Okay, so the next uh, presentation is uh, looking at... Uh, Investigating the investigating elements impact in the incremental progress of uh, organic waste compost uh, composting and waste segregation in gated uh, residential areas. So this uh, is based on a study done by the uh, PhD candidates Parazi Keswani, uh, as well as Professor uh, Tuva Chanda. I hope I pronounced the name correct. Good morning, everybody. I, Pallavi Keswani, along with Dr. Purva Majumdar, will be presenting on investigating elements in impacting the incremental progress of organic waste composting and waste segregation in gated residential areas. In developing countries, Urbanization and rapid population growth has resulted in a substantial increase in generation of municipal solid waste. Since the urban population is increasing and is expected to increase even more by 2050, the municipal waste generated in the cities will also increase. For us, it is very important to compost our organic waste onto our sites as the composition of global waste constitutes of food and greens as 44%. Taking into consideration, consideration the, the municipal solid waste generated in India is approximately 1,43,449 million tons, out of which only 35,602 million tons is treated. The MNRA report states that India will be generating 260 to 300 million tons in 2047, which is rather alarming. India had a target of completely remediating its legacy waste by 2024. But with almost half of the year has passed, 71% of the country's legacy waste is, waste is still unattended. To accommodate the quantity of waste 
from 2031 to 2050 43000 hectares of land would be required for landfills piled at 20 meters of height further moving on on the state of states released by the niti ayog of government of india we can see that rajasthan ranks the last among all the state ranks further on only 35% of the waste in rajasthan is processed talking about the legacy waste rajasthan still has its 96% of the legacy waste to be treated and hence no composting or waste segregation is taken into consideration so as we can see when we talk about types of waste different authors have described or so, or so to say different manuals have described waste in different categories but organic waste is something which is which has the highest percentage in the composition and it is in every in every study so as we can see here in the right table these are the different percentage of organic waste in different cities of india so talking about some best practices of the countries states like kerala goa andhra pradesh and karnataka have done some amazing work when it comes to waste segregation or waste composting um some cities have actually reached 99% of waste segregation and uh, a city in goa has achieved where they uh, reached a stage where they are processing 100% of their organic waste so the key to these uh, success stories is just waste segregation which is uh, done at a very large scale through the help of various uh, ngos and self help groups so coming on to the process of municipal solid waste collection in these gated communities the waste is first collected at the source either through the municipal waste worker or through garbage chute system these wa uh, this waste is then collected from the waste vehicle to the refuse transfer station where it is compacted and then transferred to the landfill sites at the landfill sites uh, there is a sorting progress uh, sorting process which happens out where from where the com the organic waste goes to the compost plant and the non organic waste goes to the landfill site so now as we have looked upon how the process of waste collection is done in these gated societies let us see what the solid waste management rules apply to these housing societies so if a housing society is producing more than 100 kg of waste per day or the society has 100 units 100 or more dwelling units or the area of these societies are more than 5000 square meters then these are considered as bulk generators and as the corporation solid waste management by law state that they need to process treat and dispose their biodegradable waste within their own premises and not to be sent to these landfill sites so for this study we have selected 10 such societies the criteria for selection was either the society should have more than 100 dwelling units or the area should be more than 5000 square meters and hence uh, putting them into a category of bulk generators so to understand the process, process of waste, waste collection waste. within these communities we have uh, taken three different typologies of societies wherein we are studying the path of how the waste is collected within their premises first is the unique tower where the uh, municipal corporation worker collects the waste from door to door uh, as door to door service and then they they uh, keep all the waste collected 
below their below each block and then the waste vehicle comes and picks it up similarly the other project uh, has a garbage chute system but then uh, all the waste is collected on the in the basement in the chute room and then the waste vehicle picks picks garbage every day third society is a villa project wherein also the waste is collected by the municipal worker and they gather the waste collected at three different points and then the waste collector machine or the vehicle takes it to the landfill site or the refuse transfer station site as we can see none of these buildings have have a possibility of uh, waste segregation or waste composting so similarly all the 10 uh, all the 10 projects were analyzed depending on uh, the mode of collection and as we can see there was no waste segregation or availability of compost plant in any of these gated societies furthermore the percentage of people knowing about waste segregation or the involvement of the rwas in the process of waste management the iec activities or fines for not following the rule were also analyzed and not a very good result came out the results here are rather alarming as we can see various parts of the system are failing at various levels even the garbage chute system is failing all many societies are closing down because of uh, various issues so following all the various reasons which came out after the study that why these systems are failing so there is zero waste segregation no rules or regulation for waste segregation or uh, no proper rules and regulation for composting although there are rules but no nobody is following them the failure of the garbage chute system lack of awareness among the residents lack of iec activities among the residents and also lack of any monetary non monetary benefits to the society to you know promote these kind of practices so coming on to conclusions gated residential societies should have an infrastructure that includes treatment facilities for the least amount of trash to be delivered to the landfill sites and uh, for a future recommendation urban local bodies should have a sustainable and flexible management plan which addresses all the existing issues along with the ones which will occur in future taking into consideration the roles and responsibilities of all the stakeholders involved uh, which we studied in the uh, last slide these are certain references uh, taken up for the study okay thank you for for that presentation so we move on to the next presentation which is actually looking at uh, designing living spaces that trigger creativity through the senses of an architectural design studio experience. So this is based on, uh, uh, this study was done by Dr. Kimen Elbik. Uh, hello, I'm Senam Mustaksevindik. Uh, today I will present three projects uh, from our design studio in Kocaeli University Department of Architecture. Uh, the title of my study is Designing Living Spaces that Trigger Creativity Through the Senses in Architectural Design Studio Experience. Uh, 2023 and 2024 uh, fall semester architectural design studio uh, one course the subject given to work on was the uh, art artist residence 
project in Kocaeli University Department of Architecture. Uh, it's aimed to discuss this issue through a dialectic of senses and creativity. The main subject of the design is how to design uh, spaces that will trigger uh, the creativity of an artist uh, in his or her living space through the senses. Uh, the design process wa was initiated uh, through this conceptual issue. Uh, which is a quite challenging for architecture students in the second year. Uh, within the scope of the study, the importance of the senses in the perception of space uh, was emphasized as the basic approach. This topic was uh, supported in the conceptual discussion uh, process with uh, print stamp digital uh, literature sources shared with students. Uh, discussions were carried out on the book uh, The Eyes of the Skin by Yuheni Palazma, which is a basic source uh, on the importance of the senses in spatial perception. The students were asked to choose their own land within the primary borders of Kojeli and Sakarya, uh, where they would uh, design, and to visit this area and document it with photograph and video recordings. After this stage, each student was asked to analyze the design area. Uh, of the three selected projects, uh, projects one and two are located in rural environments, uh, while project three is located in an uh, urban environment. Uh, an important process of the design was to think about the user profile. Uh, in this context, each uh, of the students created their own user scenario uh, and made design uh, decisions in this context. This uh, basic approach allowed uh, each student to create different needs program and uh, to come up with more creative ideas and be original in this regard. Uh, it was expected that uh, at least one person in each family would have a profession in any art form. Uh, first project, a scenario of four person family, uh, in addition to a family, um, a live-in staff member uh, was also planned to take care of the house and children. Uh, in this scenario, the woman is a painter and the man is a sculptor. Uh, second project, the users uh, of the dwelling are envisioned as a seven-person family. Um, the man is a movie director and the woman is a fashion designer. Uh, and the third project, a family of four is uh, planned to live in this residence. The man and woman are identified as a professional dancers and uh, embodying design ideas. Uh, artists are individuals who can be inspired by uh, many aspects of life and thus uh, their creative process can be nourished. Artists are special individuals uh, who have a, the ability of perceive nature and build environments uh, different than the other individuals. Uh, these creative uh, perceptual processes uh, occur in uh, living spaces where individuals spend the most time. In this context, the designed uh, residences are production centers of individual art. Uh, with this approach, uh, the sketching process marked the beginning of the process to concretize the ideas and the sketches. Uh, design approach with the senses, uh, the first project. In the uh, relationship established with the sense of sight, the visual relationship was strengthened by the making uh, spaces more uh, permeable inside and outside the space. A visual uh, relationship was established with the view of Sapanja Lake on the floor terraces and the open uh, space landscape designs uh, designed in the garden uh, of the land. At the same time, with the idea of that uh, nature is a part of inspiration, is it was aimed to uh, create a calm and peaceful environment with the horrible landscape elements in the interior. Uh, in order to stimulate the sense of sight and hearing, a sky window uh, that can be opened in the meditation room was des designed uh, and it was aimed to uh, transfer the sounds and images of birds outside to the out uh, inside. Leaf trees uh, designed in circulation areas uh, created an inviting uh, environment for birds. Uh, the plants used in the interior design and uh, in the garden also supported in the uh, the scent of nature, both indoor, indoors and uh, outdoors, to be effective throughout the land. And lastly, the materials uh, in the building were left exposed uh, so that the different textures uh, preferred in the design, such as concrete, natural local stone and local wood, could be felt. And these are uh, model uh, and the renders. Uh, and the second project, 
Uh, in the second project, uh, being uh, on the shore of Sapanja Lake, it was aimed to utilize its potential. Uh, it was aimed that the workspaces of the artist members of the family direct the overlook, uh, the lake view and the garden. Uh, in this way, a visual relationship that can be inspired by nature uh, has been achieved. In order to maintain the sound and smell of the forest, the natural landscape elements on the land were um, not interfered uh, with at all, uh, and the existing tree texture was strengthened uh, with new landscape elements. Uh, in this respect, the continuity of the fauna uh, in the immediate surroundings uh, was ensured within the land. The continuity of nature uh, within the land allowed the sounds and smells of the nature to be absorbed into interior of the building. With an iconic tree uh, passing through the living space, nature uh, is also felt indoors. Uh, the des design double wall creates uh, a different effect in exterior and interior, while at the same time uh, providing solar control. Uh, local natural, natural stone and local wood materials were used for cladding surfaces throughout the mess. And this is the uh, model and the renders, three renders. Uh, and third project, the idea was to utilize the uh, potential of being dense urban fabric. While using this, the de some determinations were made and solutions were aimed to be produced uh, with the foresight that negative relationships uh, could be established with the census. The first negative determination was to take measures against the noise of the city. Uh, for this, uh, sound insulation was design, uh, designed for the dance studio on the ground floor. Uh, in this way, dance performance process was isolated from environmental noise. Uh, another uh, feature of this project was that the dancers involved in the scenario wanted their art uh, to be made visible. In this context, uh, the facades of the dance studio were uh, designed with tra transparent concrete so that the figures of the dancing body in the interior could be perceived as silhouettes from uh, the outside. This is not uh, only strength uh, the building's relationship with the city, but also seen as a motivating way, way uh, for the artists uh, to reflect on their art. An open-air dance platform was designed at the intersection of two pedestrian sidewalks on the west side of the site, uh, thus creating a, a space open to public performances in the uh, open air. And this is the model and the diagram and the 2D drawings. In conclusion, uh, the design problem uh, of this study is, uh, can spaces that trigger creativity be created uh, through the senses? In the experimental design workshop on, organized around this question, artist residences can, be, uh, can relate to the senses were designed as a result of productive uh, discussions at the beginning of the project. Uh, in this process, for the students, conducting uh, these discussions and being able to think by entering the mind of an artist um, enabled them to develop a different empathy for design. Throughout the semester, it was understood uh, how to establish a special relationship with the senses. They had not an idea about how to develop a user-oriented, functional design approach uh, that can relate it uh, to the context which are which uh, they are located. It is thought that uh, the experiences of the students during the design process turned into important gains for them. Thank you. So thank you for for that presentation. So we move on to the next uh, presentation. So this is actually looking at factors affecting urban housing development in other centers only. Paper we authored with Professor Clinton of Bafo from the University of Johannesburg, South Africa. Professor Wellington uh, is the book father, as well as Professor Estes.
Thank you. Welcome to this presentation. The presentation is on factors affecting um, urban housing development in Lusaka, Zambia. So to present, I'm um, Dr. Sampachi Sume. So this is the paper co-authored with uh, Professor Clinton Agbampo, uh, Professor Edinton Twala, as well as uh, Professor Elastas Amanahubo. The current rate of urbanization is posing a huge challenge on housing and other critical infrastructure. It's had the effects on housing it's been experienced and failed more in developing countries, especially in Africa. Uh, despite urbanization being driven by industrialization and economic development in developed countries, on the contrary, the African experience points to urbanization being disconnected from industrialization. In fact, it is characterized by rural urban migration, which is predominantly among the low income earners without corresponding investment in housing infrastructure. Many African cities are persistently lacking the desired housing stock, with around 80% of the urban dwellers living in, in inadequate uh, housing. So this is often constructed in unplanned settlements, uh, informal housing taking the form of uh, single story shacks, uh, with uh, or rather without limited access, uh, I mean with limited access to water supply as well as uh, electricity. Most of these are usually in breach of uh, building as well as planning and regulation. So when it comes to Zambia, which is the, the study area, the housing deficit in Zambia is expected to be over 2.8 million, and experts have uh, predicted that it will exceed 3 million by 2030. No major actions are taken. So just like other developing countries in Zambia, there are two parallel systems of uh, development. So that is the formal, as well as the formal. And around 70% of housing stock in Lusaka is, uh, is inadequate, meaning the majority of the population live in unplanned uh, settlements. So these are areas characterized with poor waste management, inadequate water supply, as well as electricity challenge. So um, we did a literature review, and for literature review, we were able to identify a number of factors uh, which contribute to poor urban housing in um, developing countries. So among the factors we identified included political influence, ineffective urban planning, we had issues to do with the governance, uh, capacity, as well as a uh, lack of access to affordable housing finance. The methodological adopted uh, for this study was a DELFI. Why DELFI? We are saying um, DELFI is widely used as a technique that aims at uh, deriving consensus on a given topic by consulting a group of experts and professional backgrounds. So the premise that um, uh, the group responses are more vulnerable, I mean, are more valuable than uh, individual responses, and thus serves as a foundation for conducting deal. So the further argument is that even the most knowledgeable, uh, thoroughly researched person may have views that are not the best, but when all the opinions are taken into account, uh, the best ideas usually rise to the to the top. So um, in DELF there, we came to identification as well as uh, defining on experts. We relied on uh, HALO as well as uh, the criteria, which focuses on um, the number of publications one has done, level of education, as well as the professional experience in a job related to the, the topic of study. So we are able to identify 10 experts with presentation from the academia, the local government authority, the government ministries, the the finances, meaning the mortgage lenders, the, the non government organization, as well as the, the private sector. And, uh, most of the experts had qualifications which were allied to the, the built uh, environment. So, what we did, we distributed the questionnaires of uh, two interactive rounds. And uh, after two rounds, we were able to achieve consensus on uh, most of the items uh, based on the IQD values there. So for the results, what came up was actually that political influence, as well as uh, issues to do with uh, high interest rates, as well as uh, access to affordable housing finance, were the major factors uh, contributing to poor urban housing uh, in Lusaka. Other factors had to do with uh, weak urban governance, um, a low social capacity, as well as a uh, lack of uh, stakeholder coordination. Uh, so looking at the results, the results uh, agree with um, most of the literature evidence there on uninterest mortgages, the results agree that actually 
high interest rates as well as uh, lack of access to provision of affordable housing finance is a major factor which is affecting most of the urban dwellers in developing countries. And this contributes to a number of them actually opting to go for to go and settle in unplanned settlements where housing is uh, cheaper. And then on the political influence there, again the results agree with uh, the existing body there in terms of the literature. So again what came up is uh, the fact that uh, 70% of urban dwellers in Osaka reside in these unplanned settlements. It's actually usually a challenge for the government as well as the, the politicians to implement programs, which aims at uh, instilling order in some of these unplanned settlements. Yeah, for fear of uh, losing popularity as well as uh, losing uh, the, um, the boss there. And also, uh, political cadres tend to override institutions, especially when it comes to issues to do with distribution of. Uh, land. On urban governance again, uh, the results agree with the uh, literature there that uh, this is a challenge. Another factor has to do with uh, limited access to land where it came up uh, that actually the cost of land is a major hindrance, especially in, um, um, urban, uh, among urban dwellers there in, in Osaka. There. So again, these results um, agree with, uh, with the literature. And then also another issue uh, to do with uh, the institutional stakeholders operating uh, in silos. So that also came up in the challenge. And again, the results there align with uh, the existing body on, on the same there. So in conclusion, most of the factors which um, affect urban housing development in other cities are the same factors also affecting uh, housing development in, uh, in Lusaka. So the practical contribution and value of this study is that it provides a guide to the state as well as other stakeholders on areas requiring intervention in order for urban housing to be enhanced. It also recognizes that it is difficult for the state to provide housing alone for all the citizens, um, hence requiring the participation of the, the private sector among other actors there. Furthermore, that um, there is need also for Affording of governance principles, namely transparency, accountability, respect for law of law, um, as means for curbing, for example, uh, corruption as well as uh, political uh, influence. So, uh, thank you very much for joining. Okay, so thank you for the presentation. Apologies for that. Okay, so we move on to the next uh, presentation. So this is actually a study looking at a sequence of the transition of the Yoruba or Yoruba sector. So this is a study done by Dr. Asui. Daniel Stevens, Professor Alok Ahmad Mia. Uh, good day, everyone. Um, I'm here to present um, um, a subject titled The Sequence of the Transition of the Yoruba Architecture. My conference number is 0362 for this uh, presentation. Um, I'm going to the introduction. The study examined the transition of the compound house to the late modern. Actually, the compound house is the earliest form of Yoruba architecture and how it transits to late modern. Uh, it's a very complex maze which the study uh, attempt to examine. Uh, indeed, the study is more or less an attempt to search for the modern variant of uh, Yoruba traditional architecture. In doing this, the authors examine the works, ideas and frameworks of Yoruba traditional architecture against the backdrop of Brazilian architecture colonial and post-colonial architecture. 
first of all, let me talk about the Yoruba people. The Yoruba people are a tribe that are settled in sub-Saharan Africa, traversing the republics of Benin, Togo, Nigeria, and parts of Sierra Leone. Indeed, they also spread to other parts of Brazil. Hence, this study attempts a synthesized pattern for the transition of Yoruba architecture that led to late modern architecture, the sequence of the transitions and the relationship among the influences that led to this transition. Now, this uh, map uh, shows the uh, location of the Yoruba people uh, traversing the uh, Bays of Benin, Togo, parts of Nigeria, to parts of Sierra Leone. Now, let me quickly discuss uh, transition contextualized within this study. Uh, insight into the context of transition for this study can be viewed from the backdrop of architectural transition in the West. In the West, like um, other, well, which is the global north, uh, dom uh, domiciled countries of prosperous economies, art connoisseurs, avant garde and curious observers of the architectural landscape, uh, one could observe that, you know, uh, architectural as uh, Western architecture have, have transited history, beginning from the Byzantine to the Romanesque to the Gothic, and so it has transited for quite some time, and uh, even to more recent forms, the Art Nouveau, Art Deco, and International Style, to postmodernism architecture. So one can observe quite a distinct variation in transition. The context of Yoruba traditional architecture, which sprang from ideas of unknown designers, uh, transition is not really very, uh, uh, it's not really a trend. In fact, the Yoruba com, uh, traditional architecture does not really transit. Uh, it, it's the, the, the architecture uh, is, generally assumed as sacred and it does not really transit like other parts of the uh, more prosperous economies of the global north but uh, with the incursion of white settlers it began to transit and over the years to uh, late modern architecture and we shall examine that in the course of this presentation but let's quickly look at the compound house what is the compound house uh, the compound house is the Yoruba traditional architecture of Yoruba people. It is a very plain, undecorated structure. Uh, it is in the form of an hollow square, uh, horseshoe, and features a large single uh, uh, or more buildings with courtyards bounded by the veranda. This is the courtyard in plan. As can be seen, this is the veranda, and these are the rooms. And and this is a very large courtyard. This is the plan of the compound house. Well, this is the elevation of it, of the compound house. And now let's quickly look at the evolution of the Yoruba compound houses and how it's eventually transited. Uh, the, the compound house transited because of missionary efforts. The missionaries that came from the, way, uh, uh, from the Western war, the global north. And they achieved this by Western education which uh, encourage nuclear family uh, and as a result enhance the disintegration of the extended family collective living, resulting in dissolution of the compound house. And, and secondly, because of slave trading that lasted between the 16th and the 19th century and, you know, um, uh, freed slaves from Brazil, infiltrated sub-Saharan Africa, and brought along with them, you know, the Afro-Brazilian uh, bungalows, which are very heavily ornamented with pilasters and balustrades, and and you know, so they began to modulate and mediate the concept of uh, the, uh, the the compound house, and invented their own uh, uh, template. As can be seen in this. This is a Brazilian architecture, and, and this is uh, another prototype of the Brazilian architecture. And so the Yoruba um, compound house 
transited because of the influence of free slaves from Brazil to the Brazilian architecture. And then going further, another influence that precipitated the transition of the Yoruba compound house is the colonial incursion. The colonial brought along with them their stars. Um, following the influence of the Brazilian and Portuguese architecture, which precipitated the Brazilian style to the Yoruba townscape in the 1800s, was colonization. The British colonization was about 1900. The, 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 the concept of the British colonial houses are normally characterized by continuous horizontal band of, band of windows and overhanging heaves. A uh, typical uh, uh, example is this. Um, you, you can see the overhanging heaves in this colonial school um, designed and constructed around 1954. And so, after following that, we also have the post-colonial uh, post colonialism, which promoted the need uh, for the awareness that linked architecture to national development. Thus, countries and states in sub-Saharan Africa and southwestern coastal areas of Africa, mostly inhabited by Yoruba people and Yoruba extraction, employ the international style to achieve this. And this is an example of uh, post-colonial uh, architectural influence in the Yoruba uh, townscape. Um, these uh, examples used um, uh, organic materials that could be found in the environment uh, alongside uh, hy hybrid and uh, alongside with um, um, the uh, colonial architecture. Thus, it is a hybrid of the uh, uh, international style and uh, the colonial architecture. So the import of this style on residential architecture in southwestern coastal Africa, uh, inhabited by the Yoruba people, uh, is, min is minimalist architecture. Uh, the influence, the import of the uh, post-colonial architecture on residential buildings uh, is minimalist, minimalist architecture, which is um, usually very monotonous, as can be seen from this plate. And this trend is uh, what has been achieved in this study, you know, from the compound house through the influence of the Brazilian freed slaves leading to the Brazilian style, and then the influence of the colonial masters leading to uh, late modern architecture, and the influence of the international style on the late modern architecture in residential building leading to minimalist architecture. So in conclusion, the study, the study persists that the modern variant of the Yoruba compound house is late modern, and it is the product of architectural succession. The study further showed that the spatial layout of the late modern captures the cultural and spiritual significance of the compound house. Thank you for So thank you for, for the presentation. So we move on to the last presentation in this session. So this is uh, looking at a uh, map-based uh, crowdsourcing in cultural heritage urban memory transmission. So it's a systematic review, uh, which was done by what is Uni, as well as a uh, professor there. Uh, Hello, I am Hatice Kubra Sanoli Umni. I am a graduate student. Today, I will present a systematic literature review titled Map-Based Crowdsourcing in Cultural Heritage and Urban Memory Transmission. Cultural heritage encompasses the entirety of 
tangible and intangible values inherited from the past by societies. In urban settings, cultural heritage includes not only buildings, but also elements such as the environment, landscape, culture, and social life. This presentation will examine the importance of crowdsourcing methods for preserving and transmitting cultural heritage and urban memory to future generations. To the main objective of this study is to examine the methods used for digitalizing urban memory and urban cultural heritage and to assess the current status of map-based crowdsourcing studies. There is, this research was uh, conducted a systematic literature review. Initially, a research protocol was developed around the research question, followed by a literature search and comprehensive data set was created using advanced search techniques. The relationship between keywords in the literature were analyzed using Vosweaver software. Uh, this diagram presents the collocation analysis of keywords in the literature. A total of 5,975 keywords were examined from 1,378 research papers collected from Focus, Web of Science, and Communicate databases. Uh, in the analysis conducted using Yosweaver, 63 keywords matched at least 13 times, forming five clusters. These clusters groups were crucial in identifying research topics associated with concepts such as crowdsourcing, cultural heritage, and urban memory. Additionally, the network visual visualization aided uh, in understanding the overall structure of the literature and important research trends. Urban memory can be defined as the perception of the phases and changes that have gone down from past to present on a city residence and how they give meaning to spaces. Memory emerges uh, as a result of the data remembered by individuals in the community and shapes as a part of social production. Uh, cities have a human-oriented way to existence and live with their cultural heritage, physical environment, and all other values. Crowdsourcing is an online model aimed at facilitating contributions from various individuals or community, as it provides a sustainable, a sustainable method for data transmission by participants. Crowd participation is crucial for the preservation and sustainability of cultural heritage. Visual data is utilized in the transmission of urban memory because visuals formed the basis of remembrance in the modern era with their ability to capture moments from the past. Particularly, photographs serve as potent carriers of memory as they have the capability to capture past moments. Each photograph can evoke different memories and stories for the viewer. Uh, oral history and other methods used in this transmission of urban memory and cultural heritage. Oral hi history aims to create historical knowledge by recording individuals' memories and experiences. UNESCO has stated that oral traditions, expression, expressions, and uh, language serve as a vehicle for cultural heritage and play an important role in its transmission from generation to generation. Digital storytelling is a tool used for conveying short and impactful stories, making it a suitable method for preserving and promoting cultural heritage. Stories enriched with visual, auditory, and interactive components evoke emotional responses in viewers, providing them with and interactive experiences. Uh, Love your see, share your stories, and is a travel are both examples of map-based crowdsourcing application utilizing digital storytelling methods. Maps are practical visual tools for conveying and transferring information about the particular location. Map-based crowdsourcing applications gather data and metadata from a specific geographic area and present them on a digital map. 
Map-based crowdsourcing applications provide benefits in a variety of areas, including the pro uh, preservation and transmission of cultural heritage, tourism and city promotion, disaster risk and emergency management, urban planning and infrastructure development and environmental conservation and natural resource management. Map-based crowdsourcing applications offer diverse opportunities for documenting and preserve, preserving urban cultural heritage. Uh, as a result of the research, a table was creating, summarizing 21 studies conducted between 2016 and 2023 in the field of cultural heritage and memory enrichment in urban contexts using crowd mapping. Some papers provide evaluation of existing crowd mapping platforms, uh, while others delve into platform development process or methodologies. Certain studies undertake systematic review, concentrating on outcomes, whereas others investigate participant motivations. While many studies combine visual, verbal, and map methods, some focus sol uh, solely on one. Uh, platforms vary in media usage, with some sharing historical photographs and information, and others uh, employing additional visual and verbal methods like video and photography. Studies highlight the diverse mater uh, materials obtained across different age groups and methodologies, emphasizing and contribution of web-based crowdsourcing to digital archives creation and maintenance. Uh, in short, this review shows how important uh, it is to use crowdsourced methods to protect and pass on cultural heritage and urban, me urban memory. The research found many studies focusing on cities and using map-based crowdsourcing. These studies give us valuable information about urban culture, memory, and how they are passed on using different methods and people. They highlight how digital archives and getting the community involved are crucial for saving heritage for the future. Crowdsourcing is key here, helping communities save and share their heritage. Uh, overall, crowdsourcing has a big role in keeping urban memory and cultural heritage strong in the digital age. Thanks for listening. So, thank you for the presentation. That was the last presentation for our session, which has been an informative and uh, interesting one. I know we are about 14 minutes. Maybe I will just allow if there are questions. Maybe we can just limit the number of questions. Then we will cross the session. So do we have questions for the for the authors? So if there are, if there are no questions, um, I'd like to thank everyone for the for the contributions. Like I mentioned, the, the articles have been quite informative. Uh, but maybe I just have one question for the presentation of uh, looking at the Europa lecture. Yeah, so I my understanding is uh, from the inception of uh, I don't know if the author is there. Or if he's on the call, the paper which was looking at uh, Europa architecture. Do you have the authors on the call? It appears there are. We don't have any of the authors on the call. Yeah, I wanted to find out, for example, how they. They incorporate in the local materials and if they are standards also to support the uh, uh, the incorporation of local materials in the 
in the same Europa picture. Okay, so thank you very much for joining. And we, I can pass it over now to the chair who is Dr. Noah to close the, the session and pass on to the, I think the next moderator. Thank you, Dr. Noah. Dr. Noya, are you there? Uh, Dr. Maria. Yes. Are you there? Yes. Okay. So, uh, you are going to start now. As a moderator. As a moderator, yes. Yes, with Dr. Renur. Yes, but... Uh, mm. You no, want to be the... Oh, no, okay. We will uh, pass for her. Uh, oh, Dr. Stampa must uh, pass the hosting to... Who's the host now? Oh, yeah, Dr. Stampa must pass it to no. Yes, Dr. Mm. Sampa is the host. Mm. So... Okay. Uh, let me just do that. Mm -hmm. Okay, let me just do that. So I pass it on to Dr. Yes, no. you can pass it to Dr. Maria. Dr. Maria. And Dr. Maria, uh, please don't forget to record the session. Yes, of course. Okay, because I will yes. stop recording yes. now. Yes, okay.